Good evening, everyone. I'm Harry Sherrard, and on behalf of the Brooklyn Talks team, a very warm, a particularly warm uh, welcome to our uh, Tyrrell event uh, this evening. So we're going to have a presentation from Richard Jenkins, who is the author of the new book, and then he's going to interview some uh, Tyrrell team personnel and a little film uh, in the middle as well, and then we'll have a Q&A um, at the end. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage Richard Jenkins. Thank you, Harry. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming tonight. Um, I hope to try not to bore you too much, and I've got some people who are going to break it up a little bit. I will tell you a little bit about the history of Tyrrell, not, not in great detail, but just to try and understand a little bit more about what the team, who the team were, what they did, and why they were so successful, and also, more importantly, why they are so loved. Um, Tyrrell haven't been on the grid for over 25 years since they were brought out by BAR in 1998. And despite that, the love and affection for Tyrrell, whether it's the Jackie Stewart days, whether it's the P34, whether it, well, more recently it's John Alasi in the 1990s, uh, the underdog always pushing uh, forward. They are a team, but through the writing process and more recently, it's clear that the affection that the reviewers, the fans have got, um, they're very held in the highest esteem. Um, the, I will go through a little bit. Uh, we've got some of the photos uh, from the book, and then we've got uh, four people that I'm going to speak to uh, to give them uh, a little more detail about Tyrrell, but just to give you a little background into uh, Tyrrell. Ken Tyrrell started his, it was actually called the Ken Tyrrell Racing Team for one year, uh, back in 1960, and then he formed what is now the Tyrrell Racing Organization in 1961. Uh, that is from the uh, very first year. Uh, for those of you who know the sport, that's Henry Taylor in the suit, um, Neil Davis and Alan State, they were the original two mechanics, and Neil and Alan remained at Tyrrell until 1998, so they were there all the way through. Um, they were extraordinarily successful in Formula Junior. Uh, Tony Maggs won the 1961 Formula Junior Championship. But Ken's overall job, his day job, was as a timber merchant, and until probably about 1969, 1970, he thought, mm, this motor racing lark's going quite well, and uh, the timber um, industry then uh, went by and by. Um, but as you can see, it, that well, you can see the difference between the timbers and the car. It was always the timber first, the car second. 1964, uh, perhaps the greatest, most successful era of Tyrrell began with uh, now Sir Jackie Stewart joining the team. He dominated 1964 British Formula 3. Him and Warwick Banks uh, came first and second. And that earned him the drive with BRM, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, they're on. But Jackie remained with Ken pretty much all the way through. He did Formula 2, Formula 3 races with him. And obviously he raced until 1973. Um, but it wasn't just... Jackie Stewart, Jackie X, won the 1967 European Formula 2 Championship. And in 1968, um, well, actually, I'll go back very briefly. 1966, Tyrrell merged with Matra, or joined forces with Matra, I should say. The French organisation, but Tyrrell were still very much running the team. And it seems remarkable now, but... They very, very nearly won the um, second race. The, the first race, they had a mule car, which was never supposed to have lasted. It came uh, second. Then they nearly won in Spain, nearly won at Monaco, nearly won at Belgium, and then just the uh, fifth actual race, um, they won the uh, Dutch Grand Prix um, with um, Jackie Stewart driving. 
and just got unprecedented success from there. Over the next few years, as I'm sure many of you were, uh, Jackie's probably Jackie's greatest drive was Nürburgring 1968. It's what he considers his best drive ever. But it wasn't just that. There was numerous success in the Matra uh, for the next uh, year, until the end of 1969. The beginning of 1970, um, Matra wanted to go into the road car industry a lot more. Ford did not want to support them, so uh, Matra formed with Simca to create road cars. This caused Ken a bit of a problem, to put it mildly, because he had no chassis. He had the tyres, he had the driver, but he didn't have anything uh, to actually put the driver in. So you've probably seen it downstairs, hopefully you all have seen it downstairs, but the 001, uh, that's the original 001, there was only one 001 still owned by the family, that was downstairs and that came uh, into fruition. Uh, Jackie driving it here. And um, that didn't actually race all that long. Uh, only had four races uh, with the Jackie before the Tyrrell 003 and the Tyrrell 005 went on uh, to much more success, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, Jackie won the Drivers' Championship in 1969, then 1971, and Tyrrell won their only Constructors' Championship in 1971. And then, obviously, uh, Jackie won it again in 1973. It was uh, an unprecedented time of great success, as shown by the uh, trophies all won here. Um, I think that was only half the trophies. They had about three cars um, lined up with all the trophies they won in 1971. But the Tyrrell story uh, also has its dark side. And um, many of you will be aware of Francois Sabert, who was supposed to be the, well, he wasn't Ken's replacement, he drove for the team from 1970 onwards. But with Jackie's imminent retirement in 1973, Francois was going to lead the team on uh, from 1974 onwards, and I'm sure would have ended up being a world champion. Um, sadly, he died in Watkins Glen very last race of 1973 in practice, uh, what was supposed to be Jackie's 100th Grand Prix. Um, obviously, he never started, and at that time, it was obviously a low time for Tyrrell, but they bounced back, as, as we all know. Um, I would just like to invite to the stage uh, the first two guests. Um, first chap that I'm going to invite is one of the original Tyrrell mechanics from that golden era. Uh, Rob Coleman joined the team in 1971 as a truckie uh, originally and then went to work on as a travelling mechanic and stayed with the team uh, for many, many years. The other chap I'd like to invite is actually just in front of me here. Um, some of you will know him uh, separately. He did a talk here not that long ago. Um, Neil Trundle, um, perhaps better known uh, maybe at McLaren. Um, for his race engineering or Brabham or Rondell, you know, numerous things. But he also worked at Tyrrell uh, for a number of years and he's also got his very special claim to fame but not everybody will know about. So uh, I'll just go to stage if you can welcome Rob and Neil uh, to the stage. If you go. <laughs> right, uh, Rob, I'll start with you. Um, you. What we forget about Tyrrell is there weren't many people. You were a very, very small band of people when you won the uh, championship. January the 1st, 1971. Uh, Great days. And I was a truckie. Yes. There were six of us used to go to the races. Rowley, Roger, John Bullock. Who else? Can't remember. <laughs> Don't matter. <laughs> but um, as I say, you've got unprecedented success. Yes. Despite having so few people. I mean, did you work harder uh, together? Just hold it to you, Rob. We just carried on. It was... You win a race, you go and try another. 
try another, win another race, but no pressure, no, just a job. <laughs> fun, it was just yeah. fun. I was a, I was a truckie. I was an apprentice mechanic at 16, and then I became a truckie driving horse boxes. And then we used to go scrambling. And John Bullock, Roy Top, he's another one here. He's, um, who else was there? Colin Dixon, New Zealander. We all scrambled. So we had that fight in us to, mm. to be, you know, get there, win the race. We never won race. I didn't. No. <laughs> Jeff Smith was good. He, we, he'd go by us and we'd be stood still. And Dave Bickers and all of them. But anyway, I went to Ken's and he, he knew it was just a job, really. Good job. Fun. And what were Jackie and Francois like to work with? Did they have different approaches? Jackie was Roger's number one. And uh, I, I, was a, I went as a truckie to start with and just... I went as a truckie to start with and um, got to know different things. Jackie was really good, precise, you know, anything, you just, it was good. Sometimes we came, I remember him coming in the pits the first year I was there and he had blistered a front tyre and me stupidly pointed at the front tyre when he came in and Ken said, he kicked me out of the way and he put his foot on the tyre to cover up the blister so that um, could use, you know, didn't want to advertise a blister. Yeah. But uh, Francois, he was another good lad. Yeah, bad news with him. But. Did Ken think about, obviously, when Francois um, was killed, did Ken seriously think about packing up? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he, he, he thought. That was it. But then he gathered his thoughts. He had all us lot to look after, building new cars. And then Jody and Patrick came along. And that's history. <coughs> and then we had the P34, which leads me to Neil Trundle. Now, what a lot of people don't know, unless they were at the talk where you did it before, um, but you are the first person to have driven the P-34, not Jackie, not De Pallier, not Jody. Well, it's um, can you just recall how that came yeah, about? Yeah. It's probably my only claim to fame, or one, maybe one. Um, so um, w the car hadn't, uh, hadn't run anywhere, and um, the first thing we had to do on the car was to try and evaluate uh, the brake balance between the front and the rear, because we had four wheels at the front and two at the rear. So Derek Gardner, and we haven't mentioned Derek in all this, but Derek was a very unusual, very unusual guy, but very, very clever, very precise. So, um, and he was a real part of the Tyrrell um, organization. So we had to get a brake balance between the, the two furthest front wheels and the second set of wheels. And then we had to get a brake balance between those four wheels and the rear, as you do on a race car now. So you need you know, a brake balance to stop the rears locking or stop the fronts locking. So we got the car together. Um, and this wasn't at the uh, beginning of the season. or I can't remember exactly when it was, but we've got to remember we started the season with the 007 four-wheel. And... Uh, so we needed to sort this brake balance out first. So the two drivers were away testing somewhere. Can't remember where. And uh, so Ken came up to me and he said, you've got a race license. He said, we need the car shaken down at Silverstone. He said, you can drive it. Well, <laughs> can you imagine, you know, I mean, I've driven, I've driven Formula Fords and you've got to remember back in the day that we used to drive the race cars often from the garage down to the track or Monaco around the circuit to to the pits so you know driving an F1 car was no big deal but driving one and it was only on the club straight so it wasn't as if I was driving around the circuit and I'm sure Ken knew that he would have hardly signed me up to drive around the Grand Prix circuit so um, I uh, sorted myself out my overalls and helmet and my 
appear as my mates had to mechanic for me. <laughs> and, and they, they were happy about that, weren't they? No, they weren't very <laughs> happy. <laughs> I think it was a part of jealousy and part, who is this guy? Because I, you know, I'd only been in it. So I'm a bit of a fraud because I only worked at um, Tyrrell from 1974, April, to end of 1976 when Ron Dennis persuaded me that I should join him. And I imagined I was going to become a co-director of whatever McLaren ended up. So um, I was the new boy. And um, so we went to Silverstone Club straight and uh, it wasn't long before I got the hang of getting up to third gear and just about stopping at the end and turning around, coming back adjusting the balance. So we adjusted the balance mechanically. We didn't do it with a, with a knob on the steering wheel. So we came back and the mechanics had to adjust it a little bit more with, you know, just nut and bolt. And off I went again. And of course I was getting very confident. And um, eventually I was coming down, boom, boom, changing down, trying to, give it, trying to give it a bit of a spin turn. And of course I spun it and stalled it. And they all thought, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd just like to say you know, what an amazing day this has been. Uh, there's lots of people not with us here. Mm. Um, you know, Roland, Roland Law, who's still alive, he's 92. Yes. And 98. Uh, hey? 98. 98, or someone said 92. Neil Davis, who was, you can see, he started with uh, Tyrrell and he was just part of it and the greatest manager and the whole Tyrrell family. The last time we were here, we had a, Ken was alive and we had a Tyrrell reunion here and uh, there were a lot more of us around then, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, I mean, if you want to talk about just that, me being the first driver to drive it, yeah. And I'll tell you another little story, because um, when we finished, I realised I didn't have a photo of the occasion, but I realised that Silverstone Sid, he'd been standing down the end as the marshal, the only marshal, and there was a guy standing with him with a camera taking photos. So I rang Sid and I said, Sid, um, no photos were supposed to be taken, but if you give me a couple of copies from your mate, I won't say a word. So, <laughs> so, so we did a deal. Silverstone Sid, who always had the badges on his hat. Now, you also had a, another claim to fame, which you may have forgotten about, because you and Rowley were the two people to unveil the P-34. That's right. And you did a very... Well, I was going to ask you about this. It was a very deliberate reveal. Yeah. Because uh, for those of you who haven't seen it on YouTube, um, Neil, and, um, yeah, Neil and Rowley, they do the back wheel first. And it's, it was the back of the 007, so nothing different there. Then they do the second bit. And then finally, they reveal the uh, six-wheeler. But... Was it a deliberate thing from you and Rowley, or did Ken tell you to do it like that? The unveil, yeah, we were told the way to do it, but what you've missed is that um, when we set the car up in the hotel, I can't remember which ho big hotel in London. Savoy. And where? Savoy. Really? It's got a good memory. <laughs> Savoy. So, um, and the six-wheeler, P34, was the best-kept secret in motor racing. Um, when Mr. Bosher, who again is not with us, but his photos, I mean, Bosher had his camera out every day and took photos, any incident, you know, he's, he's so much part of Tyrrell and a legend. Um, so, uh, Clive Wharton, who's here tonight, Clive and Mr. Bosher, they made the mock-up in the clag shop, we called it the clag shop, fiberglass shop, and... Um, Secretly. They did it secretly, yeah. Secretly, yeah. So uh, no one knew what was going on there. And they were doing what was, I think, a full-size wind tunnel model. Yeah. So uh, and we were kind of, well, I was aware, something was going on over there, and I was a bit nosy. And um, that's why Mr. Bosher called me Trunky. Everyone has a nickname in motor racing. So <laughs> I was called Trunky. So one day I managed to get in there, and there was this six-wheel full-size wind tunnel model. Um, and, oh, crikey, boys, you know. And they said, Shh, this is a top secret. Well, so I walked out, sworn to secrecy, but the rumours started going round the next couple of weeks, and um, I realised that the cat was going to go out of the bag. So I went to see Ken, 
and I said, Ken, I've got to tell you that this is going to leak out and um, you best get all the guys in confidence to keep the lid on it. And so Ken gathered everyone together in the canteen and he said, this is a big press. This is important to us. If it hits the press as a secret, it's going to be a big impact and be good for our relations with ELF and all our sponsors. So, again, it was the best kept secret. So when we went to the Savoy, we put a cardboard shape over the front wheels to look like one wheel, and then we put the cloth over it. And as we revealed it, my heart was racing. I was so excited. I mean, I, I hadn't been in that material long, and, and this was my baby, really, along with the other guys that put it together. And as we revealed the cloth, you could have heard a pin drop as we lifted the bit of cardboard off the front. Yeah, it was a special moment. Big gas. Yep. Big gas. Big yeah. gas. And you could... It's on, it's on YouTube, I think, yes. the reveal. Yeah. Yes. So. Um, and just to finish off with uh, both of you, I mean, you can do your own memories, but what was it like working with the great Ken Tyrrell as a manager, as a He man? just, he treated us... He treated us normally, I suppose. He, um, he he just treated you for you know what you experienced, truck driving, mechanics, and I got the job driving the truck all from England all the way to Madrid. Just he just give you a pocket full of money to go to pay the tolls, but a big trust, you know. To, uh, Three cars on the truck, just you and, well, John Bullock, my brother-in-law now, he lives in New Zealand. Uh, he came from New Zealand with Max Rutherford mm -hmm. a year before I started. But um, no, he just let you go. And he, no telephones. Yeah. You know, we, with no phones, we just, there you go, see you at the racetrack, and two, hour, two days later we were there. So I had to cross fingers and we drove fingers all and night. The best. Ro Roland and myself, uh, first year I started, Roland was already driving the truck. And uh, you'd go down through the south of France non stop. When we had elf fuel, so we'd pull in a fill, filling station to get some fuel and then jump back in the truck and go. 24 hours non stop. And Roland would be driving, it's a left hand drive truck. He'd be sat there, I'd be over there. <laughs> Bloody mics. <laughs> and uh, Rowley would, um, he'd do this. My t um, your turn. So I would get out the chair and go round the back to the driver's side. Rowley'd get out and I'd sit my foot on the throttle <laughs> on top of his foot, slide out the seat and they take, we take over and just on down the motorway, non-stop. Good pit change. <laughs> <laughs> Good fun. Excellent. And Neil, though you weren't there as uh, long as Rob, uh, good memories of Ken? Well, yes, of course. I mean, um, I look back and, uh, yeah, special part of my life, really. Hmm. I felt uh, a bit guilty leaving at the end of um, uh, 76 to go and work with Ron. Um, because we were family, you know. Uh, Nora would come and she'd bring this. If you're working late, and we worked late, I mean, there was many times I slept on the floor of the of the canteen because I lived in Twickenham. It was a long drive, and so I'd just kept down on a bit of sponge up in the morning, make a cup of tea. And so, but if we worked late, you know, Nora would bring sandwiches down, and Ken would come along, you know, and. I think it's magic that the old building is being moved to Goodwood. I've been, I started a campaign for that about 15 years ago, and then it sort of uh, it faded to nothing. Jackie was going to get involved, but now suddenly it's happening. Yes. And so um, how they're going to fill it with all the stuff we filled it with, I mean, the whole, the walls were the laurel wreaths, and it was, yeah. I don't think they're going to have Mickey Brown's... Uh, <laughs> Special ladies' calendar, oh. I don't think. But, um, <laughs> Every good race shop may, is that. Maybe not quite as authentic as it was no, going to but, be. But and uh, so we, when I went there, 74, it was just the shed. And in 75, they started building the new building. So, um, yeah, but it was magic. If you remember, obviously, back to 76, 
Louder and Hunt, uh, Goodyear had to concentrate all their efforts on making sure all the tyres were done, and they couldn't. Nobody else picked up on the six wheeler. Um, a few of them tried, but ultimately um, it started to run out of speed. And uh, as I say, we will never obviously. The FIA will barely let anything on, and they certainly won't let a six wheeler. So as I say, it's going to be a part of history, but we'll ever be there. 1978, um, they still won. Uh, as I say, there were lean times, but uh, Patrick de Pallier here at Monaco won the 1978 Monaco Grand Prix. Uh, Nora's in the back there. But these were starting to become difficult times in terms of finance. Um, Elf left at the end of 1979, and then it started to become more difficult in terms of gaining sponsorship. They, uh, Bob, uh, who will... Um, Talk to me a bit later on, Bob Tyrrell did his best, but when you've got that huge support from ELF, it was difficult, especially recession, obviously, um, it was the winter of Giston 10, a very, very difficult time. So things didn't always go so well. Um, so they were reduced to getting drivers uh, for one-offs. Um, when Jean-Pierre Jarier um, contracted hepatitis in 1979. He was replaced by two people. First one was Jeff Lees back at Germany in 1979. The next chap was Derek Daly. And uh, Derek's career with Tyrrell went upwards, literally. And we're about to find out a little bit more. 156.5 miles. Watch for the green. Thank you very much for agreeing to join us this evening at uh, Brooklands, where we're having the launch of the new book on the Tyrrell team. Uh, and it's great to see you here. My pleasure, Harry. I'm sorry I, I couldn't be there in person. It, it's, it's a bit of a long trek, uh, but very much look forward to reading the book in, in, in due course. And congratulations to Richard on the passion and all the time and the years he put into documenting the great Ken Tyrrell and the Tyrrell team. So actually, Derek, sitting on my desk, I don't know how clearly you can see that, but I actually have a little model of you in the, the Formula 2 March in uh, 1979 with the famous Derek Daly helmet with a little uh, arrow on the head, head of mm -hmm. it. Was it. You were the reigning Formula 3 champion, but was it the success in that Formula 2 car? Was that what led to the call from Ken Tyrrell? Uh, Ken Tyrrell was actually at Donington when I drove that March at the end of the year. It was the last round of the European... Formula Two Championship, I won it. And Ken, right there and then, said, 
would you come and do the last two races in, in Montreal uh, and in Watkins Glen? We'd like to run a third car. And that was my official introduction to the Tyrrell team because the contract continued from then. I had made my debut with them in Austria earlier in that year because Jarier got hepatitis and I was a fill-in and Austria was an amazing weekend uh, with Didier Pironi, uh, which, which, which highlighted Ken's interest in me, which is why he came to Donington. That went well. And then the two races and then the full contract for 1980. Yeah, so as you said, you, you did get that full contract then for 1980, you and Jean-Pierre Jarry. Now, what you don't know is that just before you came on this evening, we, we played that little bit of infamous video of you at uh, Monaco. Things had gone fairly well up to that point. Didn't go quite so well at Monaco. Do you, you want to just talk us through what, what, what went on there? Well, in fairness, everybody here tonight is is, is a some, some small part or maybe even big part of Tyrrell history. That was a big part for me of Tyrrell history, because it's fair to say that's arguably the most used piece of Monaco Formula One video ever. And I, I was the star player in it. And strangely enough, I remember every millisecond of what happened. I remember how it happened, why it happened, as it happened. Um, and after the two and a half cart wheels, I went from, I think, 12th place to fifth, but I had no wheels pointing in the right direction. But the strange thing is, I presumed they would stop the race, but they didn't. And then the cranes began to come, and I wasn't sure what to do, what to say, where to look, what to do. And I looked over, and Jarier, who I landed on, so I took my teammate out also, Jarier had already grabbed a Giacomelli by the scruff of the neck, and he was ripping strips off him, blaming him for the accident. And I thought, oh, I might get away with this. And then I realized, of course, I'm sure there's global television here has caught this in every detail, which it did. Um, ended up going back to Ken to, you know, confess, hey, it was my, my fault. It was a pretty, it was a pretty down day emotionally. And of course, the short term was everybody thought, wow, Candy, terrible for them. They were out of the race so early. Candy didn't know whether to laugh or cry. But all these years later, Candy is still front and center because of that incident. So it, it was an unusual day and an amazing day all at the same time. Yeah, yeah. They certainly, as you say, got, got great coverage on the day and on, on, ongoing to, uh, to this time. And poor old Giacomelli getting blamed because I think you, you actually hit, hit him, didn't you? You hit the back of Giacomelli. I think that's what started it all. I, I, I hit the back of him. Uh, rolled up on his rear wheel. It was like a uh, like a conveyor belt. Put my car straight up into the air. Instead of going straight over, it fell sideways and landed on top of Alan Prost's left rear wheel, uh, straight down on it, and it acted like a trampoline. So it went boing, cartwheeled me, and I landed on top of Jarier's left front wheel, which was another trampoline effect, and kept the cartwheel running. So, I mean, I, I remember so clearly, almost in slow motion, everything that happened. But you know what? It is what it is. It's a famous piece of video. It's a piece of history. I'm sure it's well documented uh, in Richard's book. And there may be people even here today who know that that was a brand new car, brand new car. I'd never done a racing lap. It ended up in a museum in Australia, um, I believe, still with a top scuff marks from Jack and Ellie's Alfa Romeo on the underside. So you, you you completed that season with the Tyrrell team, but but it turned out to be ju just that one that one season. You changed teams the, the the following season, and did you have any ongoing contact with with Ken Tyrrell in the in the years that followed? I did, yes, yeah. Um, I, I went into television broadcasting in America, and we traveled to a lot of the races. So I would see Ken, um, and then. Um, in the year 2000, I was inducted into the Irish Motorsports Hall of Fame and Ken Tyrrell came to make the presentation. Now, I thought that was very cool because at that stage, I hadn't seen him for a couple of years. And I think, Harry, he was sick at that stage, although I didn't know it. But it was a pleasure for me to see Uncle Ken, the man who I admired so much, and then got to drive for to actually make the trip to Dublin to make the presentation for me. 
And sadly, that was the last time I saw him. But great man, great history, great family man, gave so many opportunities to so many people in all sorts of areas in the sport. Um, but the guy who, you know, made a woodshed famous in Surrey, um, you know, the history continues tonight with everybody that's here. Well, that, that's great, Darren. Well, we really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of, out of your schedule to, uh, to join us this evening. So um, uh, thank you very much indeed. And I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Sorry I can't be there. Have a great evening. So the unfortunate thing about uh, Derek and his accident, he didn't just have one, um, is <laughs> the thing is, and um, when actually researching for the book, um, I realised that Jean-Pierre Jarier actually had more accidents than Derek did. But Derek's were so spectacular. There was another one at uh, Holland, uh, at Sanford, where he's, he, again, he's literally in the air. Um, but Jarier had about five accidents um, that year, but nobody uh, remembers them because they weren't so spectacular. But either way, um, Tim will now, as I say, finding things very difficult financially and accidents weren't helping that. So you will see, but uh, Eddie Cheever um, is at the front there in the uh, Mitchell Lob um, sponsored Tyrrell, and that was literally the only sponsor that Tyrrell had. Um, that was through Kevin Cogan, who couldn't even qualify. Um, but it was a difficult time uh, for them. You can see, uh, again, as Achiever, there's a little bit of candy sponsorship, but barely anything. And again, uh, here with the great Gilles Villeneuve at Imola. Then an Italian chap came along. With, he was actually a pay driver, um, but a chap called Michele Alberetto came along. And Michele was and will forever be the last winner of the uh, Tyrrell uh, Formula One car. And the, the last win was at Detroit, um, the same uh, Benetton car that you saw downstairs. And we, uh, for those of you that were here a bit earlier, you may have seen the engine at the front. That was the engine from that Detroit race, the very last V8 Cosworth, uh, after 155 wins, that was the very last Cosworth V8 win. And the reason that Benetton even came along, and again, Bob Till will explain a bit more in a bit, um, was because of this win at Las Vegas in 1982 in the car park at uh, Caesars Palace with the Denim sponsorship, and there's a story of that. Um, but that changed everything at least temporarily for Tyrrell, and they finally had a bit of sponsorship to go forward. But Tyrrell were also well known for their innovation, not just the P34, but there were a few other things that they tried as well. And one of them is the chap that's behind me, and he's here tonight. Um, there's a chap called Brian Lyles. Brian, for those of you that don't already know him, uh, he was basically almost everything for Tyrrell for over 10 years, team manager, engineer, designer. He was the glue that made things go together. And many of you may also be familiar with his work at Newman Haas. He went over to America in 1989 and was also instrumental in Mario and Michael Andretti's success and Nigel Mansell, of course. And I'm very pleased that he's here tonight uh, to talk about some of the um, more unusual things but Tyrrell tried. So if you could please welcome Brian Lyles. <laughs> now, during your decade, uh, or just over a decade at Ockham, um, there was a lot that was going on. Um, now we had the fan car, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail because that's actually worth a bit more um, information. But you also tried the boomerang car, which I think I've got a picture of. Um, that's part of the stuff with the van car. 
and that's the actual. Uh, these are all original drawings from Maurice Philippe, the uh, designer, and all of these were kept by. We were talked about Kiposha. All of these were in his collection, which he kept. And I'm very thankful to the Tyrrell family for being able to use these in the behind-the-scenes uh, drawings. And we had something that wasn't quite as successful. Um, the boomerang car, which you had a lot of involvement with. I don't know which one we want to talk about first. Do you want to...? Um, well, uh, this, this was a result of uh, the way that the rules were written. Um, which said uh, your rear wings could only be a certain width. I think it was about um, 40 inches or th uh, so um, behind the rear wheels. However, there the bodywork could be as wide as you see here across in front of the rear wheels, um, in front of uh, any line in front of the rear, of the rear of the rear wheels. So uh, we thought, well... Um, Maybe we, we could uh, concoct a wing that stayed within the rule measurements um, but was much wider than you'd have in a normal case. So we built one and it looked pretty similar in the wind tunnel to just using the regular rear wing. So we thought, well, we've already built one for the wind tunnel, so we might as well go and give it a run. Um, and uh, it really wasn't any better. It might have even been worse. And, of course, it was a little heavier and uh, we'd already got lots of the other rear wings, so um, we kind of gave up on that one. Um, the fan that you talked about earlier, really, I had nothing to do with um, other than a bit of uh, R&D work um, when I arrived. I arrived uh, with Tyrrell um, in the autumn of 1977, um, and Maurice Philippe had already started draw drawing the four-wheel car that came after the six-wheeler, um, he'd been contracted to do that uh, by Ken whilst the six-wheeler was running its first year, uh, last year rather. And um, so Morris had gone a long way along with thinking about how he wanted to cool the car and also how he could get some extra downforce. And he thought, well, if I have a fan and suck up air from underneath the car um, and uh, blow it out the top, then maybe I can reduce the pressure underneath the car and get some extra downforce. So, well, if I'm sucking all that air from underneath, then I'll suck it through the radiator at the same time and cool the car. Um, and indeed, we, the, the 008s, all the 008s were built with a chassis which would take a radiator across underneath the back of the chassis. The idea was to bolt a fan on the nose of the crankshaft of the DFV. Uh, which would uh, suck air through the radiator from underneath the car and blow it out the back. Um, however, uh, really, we not enough because he was also designing a car from scratch, a a, uh, all the other parts, it really didn't get as much attention in terms of details, and really the fan wasn't quite big enough. We also had a lot of torsional problems with the fan on the nose of the crankshaft. Anybody who knows about crankshafts knows that uh, you, you can't just indiscriminately bolt bits of metal on a crankshaft and expect all to go well. So uh, it, it really just foundered through lack of time. Um, we also uh, had, uh, at that time, Carl Kemp was with the team. Uh, we were doing, attempting to do uh, data acquisition very early stage, it used to uh, record it on old tapes, uh, just like you'd use in your old cassette tape deck, record the information, it's probably about four channels of information, and then you'd print it out on a big long piece of uh, UV paper to, and, and attempt to look at what it, what it was you recorded. Um, we were doing that, uh, and also uh, we attempted to have active camera control as well. Um, First of all, just using a very simple pendulum system, um, again, of Maurice Philippe's uh, idea, uh, which we then converted to being a hydraulic system using Moog valves and so forth. But again, we kind of were overwhelmed with uh, trying to get it completed and get it reliable. And when we did finally get it reliable, I think in the winter of 1980, we went testing at Paul Ricard for a couple of days. Um, 
And much of our horror we found that despite we, uh, all our attempts at getting the wheel, uh, wheels to be at the correct angle to the tarmac, it really didn't seem to make any difference to the performance of the car. So uh, we had all this very expensive kit on the car and it didn't go any faster. So um, being racers, of course, it soon came off and was uh, put to one side. So somewhere uh, in, the, in the brickyard, there are some very expensive Moog valves still sitting that um, somebody ought to go and find because they're probably still worth a few thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mentioned Michele Aberretto. Uh, you had a very close relationship um, with Michele. He was probably underrated. I think we forget how um, good he actually was. Um, but what made him so special um, working with you? You know, um, not only did he win, but he did a lot for the team as well. Yeah, well, it, as always, it, there's, it's more than just, you know, um, more than just one thing. Um, but there's a nice story about when Bacaley came to us um, because he was... Um, his, uh, Sugar Daddy, as it were, was Count Zanon, who's a, a great motor enthusiast um, and had supported him through his Formula 3 career. Um, he won the Italian Formula 3 championship, I believe. And uh, we were indeed a bit short of money. And uh, um, he did a deal with Ken to run Michele. And the season had already started. Um, and uh, I, I guess terms were agreed very late on, just before the Imola Grand Prix. And of course, um, we had no time to uh, put him in the car or this, that, and the other. So Ken, being Ken, and you know, in, uh, back in the days when team principals talked to each other on a, a, a reasonable basis rather than throwing press cuttings at each other, um, he, he called up Enzo Ferrari and said, "Oh, I have this young Italian driver, and I'm going to run him at the Imola Grand Prix just down the road from you." And I'd really like to give him a little bit of seat time before I throw him out into practice for the, uh, on Friday at the race uh, weekend. Would you let us use Fiorano to run Michele? And Enzo said, of course, Italian driver. So we hove up with our Tyrrell transporter, pulled right into the circuit at Fiorano, unloaded uh, uh, one of our cars and fitted him in there with a bit of tape and so forth. And uh, McKaylee pounded round for an hour or two. Um, numerous, uh, beautifully dressed, uh, young and old Italian engineers all appeared out of the woodwork and all stood around and watched. And, uh, and then off we went to, to Imola. Um, and that was uh, McKaylee's uh, introduction of, uh, to Formula One. Um, a number of very bra nice brand new DFVs turned up at the factory the next week, which was very nice. I think they all marked Count Zanon, which is very... Um, and McKaylee was, yes, he, very talented. He loved driving right to the end. Um, as you know, he had a very long career, um, a very successful sports car career, and was really the foundation of Audi's success in uh, Le Mans and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but... Uh, his arrival coincided with the arrival of uh, Morris's design 011, um, which was a, a Morris, may, maybe one of his greatest creations. People probably would think of the Lotus 72 and 49, but it had an extremely simple but extremely strong stiff chassis. Um, and at that time, we had to run the cars very stiff. Uh, because we had these silly little flexible skirts. Um, and uh, so having a very stiff chassis, um, uh, for instance, I think the first one we put together, or the, the chassis before, 010, the last one we measured, I think was about, the chassis itself was about 2,500 pounds feet per degree. The first 011, we put it together, we tested it, it was 18,000 pounds feet. Just an unbelievable difference. Um, and all of a sudden, we found that everything, every little adjustment we made on the car made a difference. And beforehand, it never had. So that, together with uh, some very good side pods, which again, McKaylee helped us uh, develop. Um, we spent our days and days at Silverstone one winter with uh, sets of manometer tubes going up and down, up and down, um, 
doing ride height changes and so forth. And McKaylee sat in the car for like six hours in like, I don't know, two or three degrees centigrade weather, shivering and f absolutely frozen, but wouldn't get out the car so we could get it all done. Uh, so we evolved some uh, new underwing shapes, uh, which Clive here, I think, glued the shapes together. Um, uh, had a very clever rig to do different shapes. Uh, so, you know, there were many things that came together. And McKaylee, of course, excellent driver. He loved the, the stiff, responsive car. Um, and uh, for some reason, the way he described the car, I understood what he meant. And I was able to make adjustments which would respond to his concerns. And, you know, we did fairly well. Um, also, uh, at that time, there was a lot of controversy about weights of cars. And um, Tyrrell cars, one of the reasons they'd all been reliable was there was never much concern about weight. And it's one of the problems with the six-wheeler. It was very heavy, very heavy car. Um, O11 was the first really light car we built. Um, we were anything like up to about 100 pounds under the weight limit, uh, which meant in qualifying, um, you could get away running light and then you put some ballast in before they weighed the car at the end of the, end of the session. Of course, you couldn't, um, you couldn't race like that because it, you, you couldn't uh, put ballast on it that, that when the cars finished the race and went into the uh, scrutineering area. So we used to have to bolt about 100 pounds of steel sheet underneath the bottom of the car, um, which of course lowered the center of gravity, which uh, is a good thing anyway. So, um, no, it was just a, you know, a very nice coincidence of, of things coming together. Um, we maybe later on in our career with McKaylee, we, we started to really try and push the envelope and we, we started to use uh, some special pieces in the engine which turned out to be not very reliable and we certainly lost a few races that way, which unfortunately was getting pretty common with the DFV. Everybody was scrambling for the last... 10 horsepower or so, and um, it, it was just killing. Basically, usually the valve gear uh, would, uh, you'd be dropping valves, and th there was no knowing how long your valve gear was going to last, and we, we dropped out of a number of races because of that. So we, we probably didn't do as well as we should have done, and we were getting probably a little bit too greedy. And uh, to finish off with, obviously, you've worked with very different people. Um, Know, Carl Haas and Paul Newman are very different from Ken Tyrrell, but you were there, as I say, over 10 years. Presumably you learnt a lot from Ken and the team, but you then transferred over to America? Yeah, I mean, my background is, a, is an engineer and I'd worked in the car industry on the analytical side, so I was pretty happy with, with pushing numbers around and I understood this, that and the other about tyres. Um, and I'd done a lot of club racing, not as a driver, I'm a terrible driver, so... Um, but I built a lot of club cars over the years, so I had a pretty good understanding of, of, of cars, racing cars from an engineering point of view. So, of course, with Ken, is you know the classic hands-on racing car manager. So I learned from Ken all about um, picking the right tire. You know, in in the 80s with the tire wars, you know we were mainly contracted with Goodyear. They could turn up with anything up to five or six compounds and maybe even a couple of constructions. You had to sort your way through them. And not only that, um, but in those days, you could put any tyre on any corner. So you'd have a hard compound on the left front and a softer one on the right front and so on and so forth. And Ken, I think, because of all his experience of tyre testing at the beginning of Tyrrells with, in Formula One with Jackie and their Dunlop tyre testing, Ken had, had learnt a lot about how to select tyres when he'd been listening to what the drivers were telling the tyre technicians. So listening to Ken talk to the drivers about tyres and then he would always make the decision what tyres we were going to choose, I learnt a lot about the, the racing craft of choosing a tyre to, to go the race on. And then, of course, the... Um, how to run the race um, and the strategy. And then on top of that, of course, just the management of, of, of a 
team. He's very well organized. Everybody knew when you were going to leave, when you were going to come back, where your hotel was. He, you know, because he'd been, when I got there, he'd already been many of these places before. There were any little tricks he'd always remember to pass them on about how you got somewhere. So I learned a lot about um, the, the non-engineering of, of part of going racing. Very important, because if you haven't got that, you might as well not bother. So when I went to North America, um, Carl House, in some ways, is exactly the same as Ken, honest to a T, or man of his word, um, absolute enthusiast for the type of racing he was involved with. But the opposite of Ken, insofar as he was a manager, he hired the next level down, and that was it. He, he, had, he had, didn't uh, participate in any of the action at the racetrack, whereas anybody who certainly worked for Ken and been to the racetrack would know that Ken would be all over you at the racetrack and having his fingers in every pie. Carl was completely the opposite. But they were both loved it. They both ran the team. It was their team. They owned it. Whatever they said went. And their wives were involved. And it was a family atmosphere. And, and the, the people who worked at Tyrrell all have this very fond memories of working there because of the, the fact that, it, that you work for the man who owned the team. He wasn't just the boss. He owned it, you know, he wrote the checks. Uh, and it was the same at Carl Haas. Carl and his wife, Bernie, ran the team. They ran it in a different way, but they were completely honest and the same result. They, people who worked there loved working there. Great management le lessons, really, for anybody running a company of how to run a company. You've got to make it like a family. Okay. Brian, thank you very much. <laughs> So the last wins came in 83, but it was still 15 years of uh, Tyrrell. And the, well, originally the most successful year was actually 1984. Um, Stefan Beloff here at Monaco uh, came third. But at the same track, Martin Brundle, and it just, I think you forget how exposed the cars were back then. Uh, but Martin had a huge crash at Monaco. Then there was more success, a little bit better success, uh, a few races on um, when Martin came second at Detroit. But it all kind of went wrong because officially uh, Tyrrell were thrown out of the championship, allegedly for cheating. It was more a political movement. Um, in short, without going into too much detail, um, they wanted to reduce the size of the um, fuel capacity. Ken was the only one that said no, because already his cars are at 10 seconds disadvantage. He didn't have the turbos. He was pretty much the only non-turbo runner. And he said, well, I'm already 10 seconds behind. Why do I want to be even further? Um, in short, they found a way. Um, there is a bit of interpretation of the rules, but Lead shots were found, allegedly, in the um, tank, and they uh, said that there was illegal substance in the fuel. Long uh, story short, two were thrown out, uh, unjustly, of the World Championship. But they came back, they continued, and uh, again, with peaks and troughs. Um, the, one of the biggest peaks was 1990, um, when John Alesi joined the team. Uh, in fact, he joined in 80, uh, 1989. But here at Phoenix, uh, this is the first corner of the first race. Um, and John is ahead of Gerhard Berger at Senna, and surprisingly, Andrea de Cesaris in the Dallara. Um, John eventually came second, but it, all in all, there was a nocturne in Tyrrell Fortunes. It didn't last, unfortunately, and the... Um, there were some highs. Uh, this, by the way, um, at Phoenix they had the 018. The 019, which you can see here, was the first high-nose car 
signed by Harvey Process Waite and John Claude Mijo. And basically, all the cars followed thereafter. There were two more podiums for Tyrrell. Stefano Modena here in 1991. Uh, this famously was the race, but Nigel Mansell decided to wave to the crowd instead of drive. And um, Nelson Piquet, I imagine, took great pleasure in taking the win. And then in 1994, Mark Blundell uh, came third at the Spanish Grand Prix, which ended up being Till's last podium finish. There were a few highlights uh, towards the end, uh, but by and large, the team were falling behind um, and down the grid. One of the best results they had, in fact, the last points finish, was Mikasalo back in 1997 at Monaco. Uh, you'll notice, uh, for those more astute, he's actually missing part of the front wing. The front wing went on lap two, um, and Mika was told to pit, because obviously, Everybody was um, on camera, you know, uh, Schumacher, etc., etc. About lap 29, Salo appeared on the telly, and there was absolute mild, well, I would say mild, massive panic from the uh, Tyrrell crew when they realised the uh, front wing was missing. But it didn't matter. Mika said, it's fine, it's slow, it's raining, I'll carry on. And he did that whole race without uh, stopping for fuel. And until, I think it was last year, Esteban Ocon um, was the... I think he went the whole race without uh, fuel. I can't remember which race it was. But until then, uh, Mika held that um, record. The last race was 1998, uh, the Japanese Grand Prix, uh, Toro Takaji in the uh, Tyrrell, and Esteban Tuero doing his Derek Daly impersonation. Um, but that was the last race, uh, and then they were taken over by BAR, and um, obviously you'll probably be aware, but BAR became Honda, Honda uh, became Braun, Braun became Mercedes, and uh, still are Mercedes. And you'll think that there's no link between um, George Russell and Lewis Hamilton uh, yesterday and Tyrrell, but if you look at the company's house, it is the same company registration for Tyrrell back in 1964. It's still the same registration for Mercedes today. So Tyrrell are almost uh, gone. Um, Ken and Nora obviously have since uh, passed on uh, in 2001 and 2002. But there is still a reminder. Um, we've got Adam Tyrrell. Uh, Ken's grandson in the Tyrrell 001, as I say, you saw earlier, and he tries to appear at as many events as he can. And as you're probably aware, the shed um, at Ockham is still there, just. Hopefully they're going to move it, well, it is going to be moved to Goodwood uh, relatively intimately. Uh, they were hoping to have it for the um, Goodwood Revival. I'm not sure if that's going to happen now um, because there is issues with the roof. But the main thing is but that, that woodshed where numbers of cars were done, not just the World Championship winning cars, um, but I think right up until the mid-1980s there was still work being done on the cars there. But thankfully it is going to be saved and have a new home and a new lease of life. What I'd like to do is introduce my last guest uh, here, a um, very special guest, because he is the younger son of Ken Tyrrell. But aside from that, uh, Bob Tyrrell was involved in running the team for many, many years. Um, so if you could please welcome uh, to the stage Bob Tyrrell. Before you ask me anything, Richard, uh, there was a comment I'd like to make about that, uh, the Derek Daly accident in Monaco. <laughs> At that particular race, we had two guests. One was uh, a vice president international from Gillette, and the other was the European, the guy in charge of European operations for Fabergé. And I had decided to take them round to the swimming pool area. I purchased grandstand seats for them 
to give them a taste of Formula One and say, wouldn't it be interesting for you guys to be involved? I happened to be with my wife at the time, and of course the cars never appeared. And my wife said, my, my face gradually, gradually turned from a normal color to white. <laughs> and I had to spend the whole race with these guys. Uh, we never got the sponsorship, but uh, there we go. There we go. Uh, now let's just ask um, about Ken's early days uh, first. And obviously what a lot of people may not remember is that Ken actually raced himself from about 1952, I think, to 1958 and quite a good sports car driver. He had uh, trials for Aston Martin. I know your mum was not pleased about him driving. Um, how was she when he said, oh, I'm going to do team management instead? Oh, well, she was delighted, because Ken had a big accident. Uh, I think, think it was at Goodwood, where he, he broke a few bones, and mum wasn't very happy. So um, Ken's real talent was... Uh, putting the right people together. I mean, it, it, was the, it was the people that he employed that made the team. And um, from a very early stage, before he went into Formula One, that was his forte, and he was very successful in the lower formula. And did, they, did your mum ever put pressure on him to concentrate on the timber merchant? No, not business? at all. She was no, happy no, for him she was, to... she was happy. I mean, it was a nice lifestyle going, going for them going to events together all over the world. Um, I got farmed out to boarding school, as did my brother. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we, it was something that was of interest to the whole family. Now, you've specifically been involved in Tyrrell merchandise um, for about 50 years now. Um, how did that come about? And in all your years, what has been the one car or one era that has been the most popular? Well, I start, before I got involved with looking after sponsorship, which was much later, um, I was working in the north of England. I had gone to university. I was a graduate trainee with the Turner and Ewell Group, one of the big industrial companies. And I'd been working there for a few years. And I, I used to go to occasional Grand Prix, and uh, I'm sure this is something that my dad and our sponsor at the time, Elf, cooked up together. But I was at the British Grand Prix, and the, and the boss of Elf, Francois Guita, who was in charge of the sponsorship, said to me, uh, he said, there is no merchandising in Formula One. Um, Tyrrell should have, a, should have merchandise. We should have team jackets and T-shirts and things like that. He said, uh, why don't you come and do it? Well, I'd never done merchandising in my life. I'd been working for a big industrial company. He said, I'll give you 5,000 pounds to the team to set it up, which was quite a lot of money back in, in, in 1973. So we did a test market. I, I left my job. We did a test market at Monza in 1974, and we sold out on the morning of the Saturday practice. So that was it. So I started doing that uh, with my wife. Then we started supplying all the Elf service stations mm -hmm. in France uh, and Germany and Belgium with team jackets. We didn't have uh, a storage facility, so we used to make sure all the jackets came in at a weekend when the team was away, and we would pack up the jackets and settle, send them out um, uh, to the Elf stations. So we did that for a, a little while. Then we started, the six-wheeler was really the beginning of uh, proper licensing income for the team. And uh, millions and millions and millions of six-wheelers have been sold. The, the, even today, uh, we've got companies doing that. But the, my main responsibility, um, as the years went on, was for sponsorship. And um, standing in front of boardrooms at international companies was, was character building and, and very exciting, very exciting to, when you're looking at a, you know, a five, six, seven million dollar deal, um, you know, you're, you're focused. Now, what a lot of people may not know is you are actually responsible, the first man, for Benetton coming into Formula One, um, which 
then they obviously went on to uh, form their own team, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but there's also a story, as I alluded to, we uh, saw Michaelis win in the Denham, and then the next win was in the Benetton, but it wasn't quite as simple as that. Was no, it, it wasn't. We'd been, we'd been chasing Denim for some time. They're part of the Unilever group. It's a subsidiary called Alida Gibbs, and Denim was a, a world, one of their worldwide um, aftershave brands. And we'd been working... Yeah, they, they were on the Acela for a while, and we persuaded that they were bringing out a new brand called Denim Musk, which was a variation of the original Denim. And I had made a presentation to all their European people uh, at Unilever House. And we persuaded them to come on board for the Italian Grand Prix as a one-off race. And I can't remember the result, but um, the next race was Vegas. And I said, we could, I said, we might get a good result in Vegas. You should stay on for another race. And they agreed to do that. And of course, we won the race. So there we were with uh, Denim. We're all ready to come on as a not, a, not a title sponsor, but as a co-sponsor. So in the meantime, three weeks after Vegas, we had a phone call from Benetton saying, we want you to come over to Italy to talk about sponsorship. So I went over. Then they came over to Ken's house in Surrey. And we'd already virtually agreed a deal with Denim for a co-sponsorship. So we, ha we didn't have computer graphics in those days. So we had all these transparencies laid out with the Benetton at the bottom of the car and then Denim at the top uh, as a transparency and showed different options. And Luciano Benetton and his brother came over and they looked at the transparencies, they looked at the car, and they peeled off the denim transparency. They said, we, we've got a perfume. We have aftershave brands. Uh, we couldn't accept a competitor. So I said, well, you'll have to take the whole car. I said, well, we'll take the whole car. In a way, that was a risky decision because you'd rather have a mix of sponsors than have one big sponsor. Anyway, to cut a long story short, Benetton stayed with us for two years. I had a phone call. I had to phone Denim and say, the deal's off. And they were gutted. They said, well, you, you put us out in the cold. We, what are we going to do? Anyway, they joined Williams and stayed with them for 12 years. <laughs> Just the way it goes, isn't it? Now, 1984, we, uh, I touched upon, um, that must have been an extremely stressful time for you, Ken, and the whole team. Um, was Ken close to calling it a day then? Because he felt really... Uh, it wasn't so much the being thrown out, it was the, it was the cheat tag as well, I think. But yeah, I think, the, I think the worst thing was that with the way that... Um, everyone else, be the, the behavior of the whole thing. You know, and immediately after being banned from the championship, they changed the, the fuel capacity. So, you know, it, was a, it wasn't a very honorable thing to do. But as Ken said, there were a lot of dishonorable people in Formula One in, in some places. Um, I suppose at the end, one of the th towards the end, it was the the battle with Bernie that that uh, disappointed Ken the most, and that's been documented. And I don't really want to remember it, but it it took a lot of our it took a lot of our resources trying to fight that battle when we when we could have been getting on with racing. And then. Um one other sponsorship that nearly came about, I believe, uh, was Rothmans in 1990. Was that ever a realistic possibility? Yeah, we put together, we put together a package. Uh, it, we, it, it, it never worked at the time. The other one, that, the, the other one where we thought we had it, where we thought we were going to get a deal, was with Martini, mm -hmm. and that was in 1970. That was for the 1979, I think. Yes, yes 79. Um, and we put together that they were interested in coming into Formula One. And 
uh, was it 79 or 80? I can't remember. What, yeah. And um, we put together a package. And in fact, the car looked almost exactly like the Williams looked um, a few years ago when they had Martini sponsorship white with all the stripes. But um, they decided to go with Lotus. Lotus had won in the previous year with the 79. And that was a bit of a disappointment because we kind of thought that was going our way. But generally speaking, if you win, you get phone calls. People phone up, as happened with Benetton um, mm. uh, at Vegas. And it, it just make, it makes a big difference. And then one of the early reviews for this book has talked about Tyrrell. There are a few teams that rival Tyrrell for affection uh, in the sport. Um, are you, first of all, why do you think that is? And then second of all, are you surprised by the continual interest, uh, both in the shared, in Tyrrell? Um, people still approach you for merchandising at the moment now, so. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason for the affection is the, what everybody's talked about, is the family thing. Uh, Ken, my mum and dad particularly, you know, and mum and dad went to every race. Dad was there when he was 70, 72, still going to all the races, as was mum. So I think that's the reason for the affection. Funnily enough, on the merchandising, because we, when, we, when we sold out to uh, BAR, uh, we maintained, after they ran the team under the Tyrrell name in, seven, in 98, in 98 um, all the rights to the Tyrrell name reverted to another company which we had at the time, which was Tyrrell Promotions. Um, and in the last three years, the, the, the merchandise has taken off. I mean, it's not a huge business. Um, and that's partly because of the Netflix effect in Formula One. Formula One has become so popular, and as a, as a, as a result of that, people are showing interest in what used to happen. And especially in Japan, um, we have quite a large following for, from people, which is, you'd think that all the people that remembered Tyrrell were too old, and, you know, <laughs> but they're not the youngsters that seem to be interested. So it's, it keeps me busy for a couple of days a week. Good, good. Bob Tyrrell, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Have a good one. So I'm just going to wrap up. Um, if you obviously want to see me later and um, ask me a few questions, please do. Um, as uh, I think we pointed out, how we pointed out at the start, the books have sold out, which is very good news, for me anyway. Um, but the, if you didn't get a chance to buy one, um, if you put the code TIRL001 in, um, then you can do that on the Evro website and they will honour it at the same price. Um, but you would have been able to get one uh, here tonight. Um, there are lots of things still to go on with TIRL. I mean, this is obviously the end tonight. Um, but... Next year, Ken would have been 100. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to believe. So we're hoping to put things together for Shelsley Walsh. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Shelsley Walsh Hill Climb. So we're hoping to do a 100th anniversary for Ken. Um, there will be other things going on as well. Um, but the main thing I'd like to say is thank you very much for your time. Uh, your patience. Most of you are still awake. This is always a good sign. Um, <laughs> As I say, thank you for coming. Have a safe journey home. And uh, if you do want to see any of the other guests uh, tonight, please make your way over and we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, e excellent presentation, and uh, your, your guests uh, added a lot there. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for coming along to this event. Hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, look forward to seeing you at the next event uh, later on this month. It's the uh, RAF official uh, presentation team, so we go from motorsport to, to aviation. Did anybody see George Russell up in the uh, Typhoon jet as a part of the British Grand Prix? Yeah, we hope to cover that um, at, the, at the next event. 
So the only thing that I now need to do is to pass over to Tim for the raffle. Hopefully some of you bought some raffle tickets. And uh, we do have a book on the uh, Monaco Grand Prix, which uh, Lorraine managed to get signed by Martin Brundle and uh, Eddie Cheever today. So uh, it's obviously well, well worth having. So um, that's it. So as Richard said, have a, have a safe journey home, everybody. Thank you very much indeed for coming. And I'll uh, see you again uh, at the next event. Thank you very much.